In this video we're going to have a look at a few different forms of decision making uh, which we can use to provide an AI controlled entity with the ability to, to choose between the actions that it has available to it. Decision making AI is, is, is really key to um, a lot of forms of individual control within games where we pass it over to an autonomous agent. So it operates under the assumption that um, objects can be said to have certain goals or things they want to accomplish. They have a set of available actions that they can then use and we're trying to work out what is the best action uh, that will help us fulfill the particular goals that we have. If you want to think about this, uh, I suppose in, in the abstract or taking a step back and having a look at it, then there's a few uh, sort of big picture items we can put around it. For the decision making process, we have to base that upon knowledge. We need to have some type of information or knowledge which we can then reason about and a set of actions that we can then choose between. So when we're thinking about all it, uh, knowledge, there's probably two different types we could define. One we can classify as internal knowledge. That is what the object knows about itself. So for example, if it's uh, an opponent in the game, it might know its location, it might know its, its health levels and related items to that. And then we'll have external knowledge, knowledge that it is able to sense about the world around it. So this might be the other entities that are close to it, where the player is or any other things that it knows about the, the environment. And that's the input that we have into the decision making process and we'll then have some type of, of algorithmic process that will consider uh, that information we'll have a set of goals and we'll choose then an action to 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 implement For the actions themselves again we can have two different uh, outcomes and, and an action may actually change both of these action may bring about internal change so if I decide to change my acceleration or to play an animation, I'm changing something which will be an internal property. Equally, an action may be to interact with an external object, to communicate to it, to do something to it. Um, so if we're thinking about the overall process of decision making, it's useful to, to, to frame it within this particular uh, worldview. We're now going to have a look at um, like three different types of decision making process. Uh, there's lots of different types here and really does depend upon um, what you're doing, the nature of it and, and things like this. But we'll, we'll look at three which are fairly general in terms of their application. We'll start off with decision trees. They're probably the most straightforward way that we can build in a decision making process. For a decision tree, you can see an example here on the screen. It, it is, as the name suggests, it's, it's a tree-like structure. We will go in at the root of the tree and we will then be faced with a number of branching decisions. Now this is a, a binary tree that's shown here in that it asks a number of questions and the answer is either yes or no, but you, you can have as much branching as you want within the tree. At each level then, there'll be some decision that needs to be made and depending on that decision, you will branch one way or the other. When you get down to the leaves of the tree, um, they will contain actions. So when you, you've reached the end of it, you'll be presented or given the action that is appropriate for that particular route through the tree. So you can see an example of this one. We start off with the question of the root of the tree, asking is it dangerous? Let's say it isn't, then we ask is it close? Let's say no it's not close, then our action at that point is that we move towards it. And, and, and again, you, you, can, you can see how these do out. They're, they're quite flexible trees, they're easily enough built up. I suppose as they get big they become more difficult to manage. But they're, they're a fairly um, common and fairly flexible way of embedding knowledge uh, within the decision making process. Uh, as they get large, they become more difficult then to manage or to, to maintain. So they're not great for, for very complex or very large decision making processes. What I think is an improvement on those is, is what's known as finite state machines or FSMs. Uh, finite state machines, uh, they sound like a fancy name, they're not really. So a finite state machine is, is basically it's a, it's a process that can be in one of a finite number of states at any point in time. There you go, I mean it's not really much based in the name. When we're in a particular state, we have an action associated with that state. And um, 
depending on the activities or the events that happen around, I might have a transition point. I have a trigger point that if it occurs, it will transition me from one state to another state. So effectively then I'm changing the action that I would use. So that's, that's explained it abstractly. If you want to sort of view it here, we can be in one of a number of different states. We can have a transition function, and these are things that determine how I move from one state to another. And you can see in this particular diagram, for example, in state S1, we have a transition T1, which will keep bringing me around into that state. So there I'll be repeatedly doing an action. If you look at state 2 and state 3, you can see there there's transitions that can loop us between those two particular states. But if I'm in state 2 and some transition condition is true, T4, I'll move into state 3. And when I'm there, if some other transition condition is to T3, I'll move back into state 2. So we're describing it quite um, abstractly at this, this particular point, but that's the overall structure that is used. Uh, with each state, we have an associated action. So it's something we do uh, in that particular state. And this will be done in different ways. These, these can be actions that are taken just as you enter into the state. In other cases, there may be actions that continuously happen whilst you are in the state. It just depends how you construct it, uh, the notion of action within your FSM. FSMs, they're, um, they, they work by way of breaking up behaviour into a number of different parts uh, in terms of thinking about the actions that you take and the things that change the actions that you take and give you a fairly flexible structure. They're very broadly used within games and have been for many, many years. Uh, so, for example, all the way from controlling the ghosts and Pac-Man uh, to some simple bot control in games uh, to, to individual player control within sports simulations or to RTSs uh, in terms of individual characters within that. Very flexible, very capable. So we show an example, first of all, of Pac-Man. So we think about Pac-Man uh, in terms of the ghosts. The ghosts can, well, if you want to do a fancy version, can be one of three different states. They can be wandering about the maze. They can be chasing the player if the player gets sufficiently close. Or if the player picks up a power pill, then they can be evading, running away from the player. And we can see the three different states we have here. A wander state, a chase state, and an evade state. And we're assuming that when we're in those particular states, they are defining the actions that we will take. So if we're in the wander state, then we will be wandering around the maze. If we're in the evade state, then we'll be running, for example, our steering algorithms to say, let's run away from the player, and so on. If you think about the transitions, these in part triggered by whether or not Pac-Man is in range or if a power pill has been uh, eaten. And you can see the transitions here. So if we're in the wonder state, there's two transitions out of that. Uh, first one, Pac-Man's in range. If that's the case, then we transition from wonder to chase. And the other transition state from wonder is power pill eaten. In that case, we'll transition from wonder to evade. So you can see there the structure has happened. If we're in the evade state and the power pill's expired, then we transition back to the, the wonder state. And if we're in the chase state, then we've got, you know, either Pac-Man goes out of range and we go back to wonder or a power pill's eaten and we go into the evade state. So it's a nice, it's a compact means of representing the behavior of uh, one of the ghosts uh, within Pac-Man in this particular instance. Um, you can make them a bit more sophisticated in terms of how they, they, they structure them. Um, they, they're, they're good, I mean, they fit into to, to a lot of, of scenarios. You see another example uh, there where uh, we have a character that in terms of what it's doing is either entering a mine and digging for a nugget it may get thirsty, where it wants to quench its thirst. Uh, when it gets a nugget or sufficient number, it may want to visit the bank and deposit some money, um, or to go home and sleep until rested. So that's a more of a sort of an RTS type of, of behavior. And, and you can see that. So overall, in terms of SFSMs, people use them because they're relatively quick to, to, to code, to, to debug. They're reasonably simple structures. Um, they're, again, by, in comparison to other techniques, these are reasonably efficient. Okay, it does depend upon the, the, the transitional functions and how difficult they are to evaluate. Uh, they are flexible. 
Um, they're generally speaking easy to extend or to modify or there's extensions to FSM that lets them scale up to more complex scenarios and they, they map on well to a lot of objects that we'll have within games. So to give me an example of something that's a little bit more fancy, uh, this is an example of a hierarchical uh, FSM and um, the yellow uh, diagram you see over here shows a potential problem where we're going to use a hierarchical FSM to overcome it. So here we have basically um, an FSM for um, a robot that goes around picking up rubbish. Uh, so the main life cycle is it is searching for rubbish. Whenever it finds some trash, it then goes it, picks it up. Whenever it's collected some trash, it then heads to the compactor and deposits it there. After that, it goes back into the search routine. So we search, we pick it up, we deposit, search, pick it up, deposit, and that's what we do. However, in each of the states, you can see that we have a similar type of transition, that if we get low in power, then we have to go and recharge. So it doesn't matter if we're searching or trying to pick something up or heading to the compactor. Whenever we get low in power, we'll, we'll postpone that activity. We'll go, we'll recharge, and then we will recontinue with the activity that we were doing. So at the minute, you have that transition from every single state, and it's a bit cumbersome. Uh, and hierarchical FSM is one where basically you have um, a, you know, a set of SMSNs. And whenever you transition to one, you're not going into a single action within that. Rather, you have an FSM within that FSM state that determines what the action is going to be. So here, at the highest level, we have a simple uh, finite state machine with two states. Either we're cleaning up or we're getting power. And the transition is either we need to have power and we've been recharged. That's what we do to transition between that simple high-level two-stated FSM. If we're in the cleanup uh, activity, then the action that we take is itself determined by another FSM, and that is the search head for trash, head for compactor uh, FSM within it. So it gives us quite a nice way of actually scaling uh, this up. Uh, so FSM is very commonly used, very flexible, certainly something worth considering. The last form of decision-making AI we're going to have a look at here is known as Goal-Oriented Behaviour, or GOB. Uh, it's the type of thing that's used quite broadly within games like The Sims. Uh, in essence, where you have an entity that maybe has a range of different uh, um, you know, traits or characteristics or things that it wants to achieve. So it's not a single goal that it's trying to achieve, but there are a multiple, um, several different things that we're trying to maximise. And quite often these types of games, there's a range of different activities that are available and we're faced with the question of, at this point in time, for the character, based on what it wants, what is the right action for it to take? Uh, so we're trying to, as mentioned at the bottom, GOB algorithms try to fulfill the character's goal by selecting between available actions that influence the goal parameters. So I'll show you uh, an example here. So we've got a um, number of goals and a number of actions. And you can see this we're in the yellow box. So the goals, we have only three. We uh, want to be, we want it to be, to feel full. We don't want to feel hungry. We want to feel well slept. Um, we don't want to feel we have to go to the bathroom as well. So we're, we've got insistence values associated with these. So zero means I'm happy. I have no particular compelling need to do this. Five means no, I really do want to do this. So at the minute we've got uh, an eat insistence of four. So I'm fairly hungry. I want to eat. I've got a sleep insistence of one, so I'm reasonably awake well, and don't particularly want to go to sleep. And a bathroom insistence of three, so I wouldn't mind going to the bathroom. I've got a, a set of available actions that I can do. Um, so I could eat some food. Now, if I do this, and this gets into the interesting bit then, because taking actions can affect more than one of our goals. So there, if I eat some food, my, my eat insistence will decrease by three. Uh, down to a minimum of zero. But my bathroom insistence will increase by one. If I eat a snack, then just eat minus two. If I sleep in the bed, sleep minus four. Sleep in the sofa, sleep minus two. And you, you can see them here. So we've got a range of activities and they will influence the insistences that we have around with the goals uh, for the character. So your question is, out of those available actions, for this point in time, given the insistences that I have, what's the best action to pick? to tech. 
Different ways of doing this. Uh, one good way to think about is, is in terms of overall discontentment. Uh, so it's not to look at how happy the player is, but how, or how happy the character, how unhappy um, the character is. Uh, and a good discontentment metric to use is to take each of your goals, the insistent values, to sum them, so be four squared, one squared, and three squared, in this case, for her eat, or sleep, and her bathroom, and then to add together the sum of all of those values. Um, so we do that down at the bottom. So you can see there that if we eat some food, the um, overall, uh, so, so 4 minus 3 will go down to 1, we'll square that, we'll get 1. So our eat insistence will turn to 1 and we'll square it. Our sleep insistence doesn't change, so that remains a 1, we'll square it. And our need to go to the bathroom will increase by 1, so it'll be 3 plus 1, we'll square it and we'll get 16. So in this case it would be 1 plus 1 plus 16, we have an overall net discontentment of 18. If we eat a snack, in this case it's 4 minus 2, uh, so 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 3 squared, we'll get an overall discontentment of 14. If we sleep in the bed, uh, so again you, you can see then we, we retain the 4 squared plus 0 squared plus 3 squared. So you can add this up for each of them and then you get your net overall discontentment out the other side. You can see for this particular scenario with the actions and the consequences of those actions, um, eating a snack is the best thing to do at this point in time. Uh, and that's what the, the action you would, you would take. Now that's very much the essence of um, goal-oriented behavior. What makes it more sophisticated is you can then have algorithms or things that take into account the ease with which you can do these or the time required in which you would do that. Um, and again, that can tie into other traits or characteristics of the, the character. So it's quite a flexible system that expands it out to, to really to embody a lot of different personality traits, if you like, in, in terms of how characters choose between uh, the actions that they have uh, available to them. So that's it. We looked at uh, three different forms of uh, decision-making technique. There are many uh, different forms that are used, but these, these three are, are some good examples of what's typical uh, within the, the arena, and also ones that are quite broadly flexible in terms of being useful within a lot of the different types of games that you'll be doing. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of this, decision trees, finite state machines, these are sort of bread and butter activities that you may want to consider. And if you do have multiple goals, multiple traits, multiple characteristics, something like goal-oriented behavior, generally speaking, offers a good um, fit for that.